What up, party people? Welcome to another episode of the One Deeper Podcast. I'm glad you're here. I know it's been a minute. I had to focus on school, focus on focus on work and exams, but I'm back, and we have an episode with none other than Dr. Marine Van Vingerden. I'm sorry, Marine, if I'm butchering the last name of last name. But in this episode, we talk about the brain, neuroscience, um, dopamine. gambling addiction my own problems and well if it's basically a therapy session for myself and dr marine was uh, kind enough to indulge me and it was a great episode i hope you enjoy it i hope you learned something thanks again for listening and i'll catch you on the flip side Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a while. Tried to make this happen and finally managed to manage to uh snare you into sitting down and talking to me today. So that Definitely. Nice. So that's nice. So thank you for that. It's, it's the one week between between wrapping up all the the teaching and going on holidays that I that I have some time to do oh, fun, nice. fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so sure. there you go. Perfect. Um So man, I have so many questions. Okay, <laughs> but but let's start like from like just like some background, I guess. Like, how did you end up in this? Like, how did you end up here in Tilburg or like studying neuroscience and stuff? How did you get here? Yeah, sure. So, um, my name is Marijn van Wingerden. I'm I sort of self self identify as a cognitive neuroscientist, I guess, um, first, and. Uh, my journey started in uh, in uh, Amsterdam University. Um, I uh, took up um, a bachelor in medical biology at that time. Medical biology, like just medical like, bio- like yeah, medicine, like like a normal like a doctor would do. I, actually, oh. it is a it is a place that uh, a lot of people who didn't get into the medicine due to the lottery system actually uh, took up. Okay. Yeah, while they're waiting for their next chance to maybe uh, uh, enroll again in medicine, so we were sharing the building and the faculty with the biologists, the like the real hardcore plants and uh, and uh, and animal biologists basically, and um, uh, we were there as well. So it's an odd mix between people who are really happy that they were uh, at the at the outskirts of Amsterdam um, studying biology, and a lot of people actually would rather be. in the university hospital instead but uh, there we were and it was in my third year that we finally got some uh, a course that i that figured my interest in the brain uh it was a, actually a range of a couple a couple of short courses one of them was called i think pathophysiology of the nervous system something like that and we got we got to talk about uh, alzheimers and parkinson's disease and all of these things that are super interesting and um that sparked my interest So um I took up my um uh by the way this is going to be a long story. No, <laughs> no, you, no, want, this, you want the short it, one, yeah. No, no. It, 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 go wherever you want to go with this. It's totally fine. <laughs> right. There's no there's no plan here. Yeah, so that that was when I um we did, did a few internships with um uh PhD students and postdocs around the around the campus. And one of them was on um uh, recording uh neurons with patch physiology so patch clamp uh of um uh the mouse brain basically so the procedure would be you would get a slice of the mouse brain and i have to make a, a connection with this glass pipette to the membrane of this cell and um once it is connected there is sort of a magical moment where the there is a, a jump in the voltage and you're now measuring from the inside of the cell and um yeah that seems like totally fascinating and very very cool and uh, because you can see the yeah the dynamics of an individual neuron and um uh, all the things that we learned about you know, basically are at that point under your control so you can inject some current you can give a neurotransmitters and see what it does so i decided i wanted to do neurobiology and i took up an internship at the netherlands institute for uh uh for neuroscience uh also in uh uh close to the medical center and there um i was introduced to basically in vivo electrophysiology so that means you have some animals you train them to do a behavioral task and then you try to implant electrodes and record their brain 
while they're doing this particular task. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, you try to correlate uh, the neural responses to the, the things that the animals did in the task, basically. Right. And um, that bit that went on into uh, an offer to do a PhD in Amsterdam, which I did. Uh, and uh, I took I took absolutely ages to finish my PhD. Uh, in the end, it was, <laughs> I was I was done at you know there were four years were passed, and I was just still collecting data. I hadn't written any manuscript yet, so that is that's definitely not the way the way to do it. Uh, I should tell any uh, you know aspiring PhD students. <laughs> but in the end, I took nine years to complete the whole thing. Uh, nine but I got some, years. Nine years. Yeah. Holy crap! That's a long time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. more. That's that's two PhDs basically. Two PhDs. <laughs> um, some of it self-funded in the end, which was actually also not ideal. Yeah. So, um, uh, but I got some really nice publications out of it in the end. So, um, um, I probably wouldn't do it again in in this this way if I uh, if knowing what I know now, but um, the, at that point, um, I just persisted and uh, managed to get nice publications out of it. So knowing what you know now, uh, if someone w did want to get into neuroscience, what kind of bachelor's program do you think they should be looking at? Oh, well, um, I would say neuroscience is a very broad area, and you can approach it from a lot of angles these days. Of course, there's our own program in cognitive science and artificial intelligence, which is very interesting at Tilburg University. There is a very nice uh, program at the uh, University of Amsterdam. It's called Psychobiology, okay. and that one also nice. in includes a lot of, um, uh, well, of course, psychology, but also uh, some uh, some of the more neurobiologically oriented courses, basically. So it, it goes down to cellular, cellular stuff as well. And I think that's, that's pretty good. That gives a good foundation. Uh, there's people joining neuroscience from chemistry backgrounds or physics. And uh, of course, people who are starting out in AI maybe, and then finding out that they want to learn something about the brain as well. Yeah. So like, if I, so like, what about the, the trajectory from like a computational, like, like, say how like, I don't. I, I mean, maybe I'm mistaken, but like, there's a there's a growing sort of strong computational neuroscience aspect to it. If, I feel like, so if someone was like, oh, I'm just gonna do a bunch of uh, hardcore computer science or mathematics stuff, is there a, is there a, like a pathway there? I don't know, cause like I'm I'm just curious, cause for me. Right now, I'm in this interesting place where, like, I I love the br I love everything to do with psychology, the brain, and everything. As but I also really like 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 computer science and programming and stuff like that as well. So like, I'm pretty happy where I am. It's, for me, it's perfect. <laughs> like uh, this program. Um, but I can you. imagine yeah. that some people who who are like, oh, I want to do more like hardcore neuroscience, where like more get get more worst with the neurobiology and the neurochemistry and like take some you know like organic chemistry classes and stuff like that yes um but yeah all right so um there's a lot in there to 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 discuss i would say one of the things that i find that is has been a trend uh, and that we're really seeing in the neuroscience research community these days is that people have found ways to record uh, more cells more neurons at the same time so uh, it was already possible to do this with uh, with MRI, uh, obviously, but that gives a rather poor spatial resolution. So um, people, when they were interested in figuring out what individual neurons were doing, they would usually resort to either uh, yeah, batching a cell or putting in uh, extracellular electrodes to record those cells. And those techniques evolved. And at some point you could record you know, something between 50 and 100 cells maybe at the same time. But that is even that is that is you know the vast minority of the the cells that are active in a particular brain region, and we also know that you're sampling then only from the you know the most uh, outspoken neurons basically the ones that are that you actually get to see and get to record because they're mostly active. So it is it is an unfair and, and uh, underrepresented uh, underrepresentative sample basically. Now, these days, uh, we have more optical techniques for uh, recording uh, activity from a large group of neurons at the same time by measuring sort of 
dynamics uh, that are related to calcium. So calcium mm -hmm. flows into the cell when there's an action potential. Or, and also when there is not an action potential, but just a current from a presynaptic cell uh, making, uh, you know, opening, a, opening a channel and there's a current inflow to the, into the postsynaptic cell. And that basically allows you to measure not only spiking activity, but also just the background activity of all of these neurons when they're not spiking. And some of them actually spike only very uh, every once in a while, right? So, but actually those background, uh, the background activity can be much more informative. And um, so you're not biased so much. You have a large uh, field of view. You can record uh, even multiple brain areas at the same time. And that is really pushing um, data acquisition. And with that, there is now an increasing need for people who can do, uh, who can handle like large data formats, uh, large data sets, and develop the tools that, that you need to um, go beyond you know, the typical correlations you would find between a particular neuron's uh, firing rate and a particular behavior, for example. Mm -hmm. Rather to think, but what is this population of cells actually doing? You know, what is it responding to? What is it not responding to? And what are its intrinsic dynamics? Is it is it showing like arrhythmic patterns, for example? Um, are those patterns aligned with other brain regions? And if so, how is that? changed by maybe something the animal's doing, for example. So, so the technique came first, and then it opened up this whole new area of investigation, which right. um, has, has, le has led to much more interest in computational approaches, because now you need to do that, basically, to make sense of um, what you're seeing. So okay all right so but i have i have a bunch of tangents to t tangents to go on here but like for from what i understand what, what little i understand so like most of the neuroimaging is it mostly happening in the cortex like just in the cortical areas um mm -hmm. as opposed to like the more deep structures in the brain so yes. like yeah so uh, and what what's being done to like, like, you know, like okay so is it important like do we need to care about the deeper things or no like i feel like i mean, I mean how do yes we, obviously we, of course yeah. yeah but like how do we like, like what's the strategy to get there because like right I, like like i heard this uh really interesting really funny analogy where it's like uh there's a guy in a park um and he's and he's looking for his keys right and he's like looking for his keys where this light is on the uh, on the on the street and the uh, and the policeman comes by he's like what are you looking for and he's like i'm looking for my car keys and he's like did you lose it here he's like no i didn't lose it here but this is the only place with the light so this is where i'm gonna look yeah yeah that's, so like, that's pretty strong yeah <laughs> <laughs> well there's there's a way to bring the light to to where you lost your keys actually and people are doing that in animals by uh implanting something like a cylinder that is refractive on its inside and it, it brings the light from the and the microscopes, the lasers that are used for recording, uh, all the way down to deeper structures in the cortex. But that again is quite invasive. You have to implant something and then you can record from these from these deeper structures. Um, so that's that's not ideal. Um, what we see is that there is more um, data sets coming, uh, becoming available from people who are, are undergoing neurosurgery. And, mm -hmm. and they're being, for example, uh, fitted with uh, electrodes for uh, deep brain stimulation. And this usually targets uh, brain regions in either uh, the basal ganglia or the amygdala, sort of, you know, the older parts of the brain, basically. So you get these electrodes that are being um, driven down through the cortex all the way down to these deep structures. And uh, while the neurosurgeons are doing that, they keep good track of where they are by sometimes making little stimulations to see uh, which parts uh, or how deep are, uh, and, and how deep you are in the brain and how that relates to this individual's particular um, cognitive function because uh, the you know, the precise borders of neural regions differs from people, to, from person to person, and uh, we need to know for this person who is having the surgery right now, actually, you know, whether their language center is exactly where it's supposed to be, or maybe it's a little bit to the left, and then you want, might want to do something else, basically. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So there you get a very um, 
limited but very interesting, highly interesting set of um, human uh, neural recordings from deep structures. Yeah. Nice. That's cool. No, like uh, so. Uh, this is this entire field has is that a, is that a, how 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 much how long of a history has this had like it's like how long have we been able to be able how long has it been since we were able to actually like record the activity and see like and match that to cognitive and match that to behaviors um this is like a fairly fairly recent thing um well, if um, so, recording neural activity, I think that is mostly a 20th century uh, endeavor. Uh, so I remember when I started um, uh, my you know, university education uh, around uh, the end of the 90s, basically. Um, that was the time when these these more advanced um, electrode electrode recordings uh, were just being sort of invented so we were going from one electrode to two electrodes uh, it's called a stereotrode and then a tetrode that's four of them together and that gives you better um, discriminability between different neurons that are sort of around at uh, the tip of your electrodes and that was i think 1992 or something when that happened so before that people were just recording from single wires mm -hmm. and you can chronically implant them in the brain to record from where they are and then people thought like, well, maybe we can actually put them on a little platform and drive this platform down through a particular neural structure to sample more more cells uh, you know, from day to day. And that's basically how this was a little bit developed. And, and these days you have um, very sophisticated sort of, uh, uh, it's like a chip that has like 100 little uh, shanks coming out of it. And all of those shanks have like 10 to 20 contact points. So you're looking at, Rather than a four electrodes twisted together, they're in the same area. You can you know, sample like from 1,000 contacts or something at the same time. So that nice. that also unlocks looking at the at the 3D structure of a particular uh, cortical column, for example. And uh, so cortical column is basically sort of the organization of the cortex is in different layers. And wherever you look at the cortex, this general organization pattern is more or less the same. So you can cut down and look from the outside to the inside uh, of the cortex, and you'll find these layers. And they have a distribution of different cells. So there's pyramidal cells and interneurons, and it follows sort of a, you know like a blueprint more or less in the same way. And uh, wherever you look, and having such a such a 3D structure of uh, oil, yeah of little electrode contact points basically allows you to map really the, precisely the spatial um, configuration of the cells that you're recording. It's so really are cool. we able to like say like pinpoint to specific cells and say this cell is this and this cell is that? Like do we have that level of understanding? At this point, yes. So, so what you would have is you have multiple contact points that are all sampling the same action potential uh, at the same time. And by triangulating from those recordings, you can actually say, okay, it's it's a bit to the left and 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 you know half a millimeter above the, this contact point. That's where this cell is located. So it must be a layer three uh, interneuron, for example. But um, um, people uh, have made you know uh, entire careers out of looking at these electrical uh, voltage traces on an oscilloscope. Uh, to see you know what type of neuron you're dealing with, so pyramidal cells uh, that are usually thought of as sort of the main output cells, they have a have a pretty wide uh, waveform for their action potentials, versus interneurons have a much shorter uh, waveform, for example. And just by looking at uh, at the shape on your oscilloscope, you can uh, you can tell them apart basically. So okay, so just so for let's, let's just like let's just take a step back for anyone like so we're like I'm familiar with these terms because I took your class. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So okay, let's like let's do like a quick like too long didn't read of how generally like the what neurons are generally what they do and like why they're different from other cells let's say you know in your brain or like in your body. If you had to, sure. like, if you had, if someone was like, you know, someone has, if you, if you were in an elevator and you had like ten floors to tell someone how the how 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 the brain does its thing, 
what would you say basically yeah. <laughs> explain it to your grandma yeah well okay so the the our entire uh, co cognition all of our thinking and consciousness is supported by neurons that are talking to each other in in our, inside our brain they process incoming information and they control the muscles basically and they do all that by um, sending electrical impulses uh, from one cell to another. And uh, that is done across the synapse. So there's electrical transmission, which is turned into chemical transmission when neurons release neurotransmitters, which is then again converted to electrical transmission in the next cell. So that's how it goes. Now, when you think about light hitting your retina, it goes through a couple of uh, neurons before it finally reaches the visual cortex in the back of your brain. And that's where you know, sort of the conscious percept of whatever you're seeing is being generated. Now, how do these, brain, these cells do it? They have to maintain something like a battery inside them, which is what we call like an electrical potential. And this costs energy. So that means if you don't have energy, your brain shuts down and you can, you can always, you can, you know, uh, lack of oxygen, lack of uh, glucose is a, almost it's like a death sentence for the brain your brain your brain goes down really quickly and we know about this of course so um the the bit of communication the unit of communication is called an action potential and this happens when uh, the voltage uh, of a particular cell is changed by its inputs in such a way that it's being stimulated to fire basically so you can think of neurons as being uh, a large bin of electrical potential, and there there's like 10,000 other cells that are making contacts to this particular neuron, and some of them are trying to make it fire, and some of them are trying to inhibit it from making fire, uh, making an action potential. And this balance is um, driven, it's basically constantly in flux. So whenever there's enough stimulation, uh, this threshold is broken, and then we get this process that is very stereotypical, it's called an action potential. So some, some chemicals go into the cell, all our chemicals go out of the cell, and basically this constitutes an, uh, like a go, a go signal for this particular neuron. And it sends its, uh, when, when this happens, it sends its own electrical impulse down its axons. So those are the, the long tails mm -hmm. that each neuron has, and that brings it to the next one. So this might be inside your brain, but you could also think about a very long axon that travels down your spinal cord all the way down maybe to the muscles uh that need to move so no matter like mm -hmm. so so like just, there's just all this always this ongoing hum of electrical activity in your brain right like it's not like when you know it's not, it's not like it's oh i'm not doing anything there's, there's nothing happening in my head it's like just no. breathing just existing just the the mere act of being alive is yeah. is is that like that's an interesting question? Is like is being alive? Are you alive because there's activity, or, or is there activity because you're alive? <laughs> right? I don't know. Well, we know but, that uh, uh, maintaining maintaining life in in a body depends on uh, mostly uh, you know breathing and, and the heart pumping blood around, and uh, some of those processes are also controlled by um, some very old uh, yeah we call this nucleus so uh, you know parts in the brain. In the brain stem actually that control breathing and um, uh, and your heart rate. So you can be what is called technically brain dead. So that's there's no activity in your cortex. But those um, uh, very basic uh, information processing units in your in your brain stem are still functioning and they're they're keeping the body alive. So a lot right. of that is you can think of that as as a reflexes for survival. They are just they will keep going uh, until they run out of steam somehow, or they're just they're you know they're too old and they're decaying. And um, external uh, pressures can have some influence on them. You know, so, you know you're a meditator, I think. So if you, yep. if you meditate, you can try <laughs> to slow down your breathing consciously. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible. Um, but for most of, the, of our lives, we are not conscious of these um, factors that are just ongoing, basically. Yeah, I mean, it would be possible. Like, it would be, just imagine having to be conscious of, like, blinking your eyes or, like, uh, breathing or, like, or, like, or, like, or, like, or, like, like, imagine having to be consciously aware of having to generate saliva in your mouth. 
Or like, it would be uh, we wouldn't get anything done, right? So it's, we would, it's, like, it's too much. Nothing, nothing would happen, right? Like if you had to like consciously like release the um, tears to keep your eyes lubricated. Like there's so many things that happen that we don't even realize, right? It's crazy. It's all automated now. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. I mean, for good for good reason, I guess. Oh, well, this is interesting. So it it taps into the the idea of homeostasis. Uh, mm -hmm. So our bodies are maintaining homeostasis, but um, uh, people, some people. Some very influential people also say that our brain is trying to maintain homeostasis. So, what does that mean? Um, it it means uh, this is the work of Carl Friston and others that uh, say that the brain is trying to be a is is a Bayesian machine and it's trying to uh, optimally predict its input from uh, what it's seen before, in order to expend as little energy as possible at processing that input. So the more you're neural circuit is uh, expecting its input, um, the less needs to be changed. And, and this is this relates to the free energy principle, which uh, can be sort of minimized in a way to oh, this is interesting. function so like, optimally. This is, so, this is something, this is where like, like my, my, my interest like really gets peaked, right? Like trying to sort of infer the underlying objective function of the brain, right? Like what is it actually trying to do? Like, like you know, it's like, like minimize error or like, Make it easy to predict things, right? Like, it, like I, I, I like I like this idea that like because because if you look think about it from an like from like in a in billions of years ago perspective, like how abundant was energy? Like how how easy was it for us to acquire calories? Like from the let's 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 just say from from the point where we started using external like calories for energy. I, like my intuition is that energy was pretty hard to come by, and that might have. Well, I think, yeah. So so after we sort of ingested uh, uh, like energy uh, producing microbes in a way, mm. right? Or the, the cells did that, and um, and yeah, I, I would say that sort of you, the further you get away from. Uh, photosynthesis, uh, the more complex you have to make the organism in order to to maintain uh, its energy balance somehow. I read this, uh, I, I don't know where this is, but like, I, I can't remember where I read it, but there's an experiment where they were testing uh, glucose metabolism in the brain, and they basically got people to play Tetris, right? And then the better they got at playing Tetris, the less energy their brain was using like oh the, yeah the, so yeah the areas the, the areas the brain uh the, the the less energy they were using so like your brain is trying really hard to like to up to up to optimize things right and to use yes. to be very right. sparing with stuff it needs although your brain does use most of your energy right like it's like 25 percent of your daily energy requirement or something i not i'm not uh i don't have that figure uh, like a, like already, but, I, I'm pretty sure it's a, like a significant chunk of your energy per day is used by your definitely. brain to like do brain things. So it must be worth something, right? That's that's yeah. the cor the corollary of it. So why why else would we evolve it if it uh, if it wouldn't bring us uh, evolutionary advantage? So um, this idea of foraging and living at the margin of your energy consumption that is super interesting because it, it taps into something that I know you want to talk about, which is decision making yes, under risk right. and ambiguity. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, I, I was reading up on some things today, and I, I found this um, uh, interesting tidbit: is that um, when we're talking about um, what is valuable? We economists use utility uh, for that as a unit. So util is something that you know is um, it doesn't really exist, but it it uh, stands for some some subjective value that is specific to uh, the agent that we're talking about. And uh, I was looking at risk. Uh, so risk is um, understood as uh, a distribution of possible outcomes. And then the, the, the easiest way to think about risk is just a, a coin toss. So there's, there's two possible outcomes. Uh, they have equal probability of occurring. We all know that if you you know if you throw a, a coin 100 times, it's going to be about 50 heads, depending uh, the stochasticity. And um, um, why would you want to uh, 
optimize for risk or where would you want to select risk at some point? Well, so um, it is found that not only um, humans or primates are, are risk sensitive, but all, a lot of animals actually show this risk sensitive behavior. And it's very interesting when you go look at uh, animals foraging behavior and living on the margin. So when they are confronted with a sure choice that produces a stream of calories in a way that is subsistence, so it doesn't get them over, you know, it, it doesn't get them over the edge versus the same budget, but then spread out riskily. So, you know, there's a chance of getting uh, something that is enough to survive another day, but they might also uh, draw something that leads them to die on that particular day. Uh, a lot of animals will choose the risky option because in the long run, uh, the, the safe option is, is also a sure way to, uh, to perish. Basically it, it will not wait, sustain wait, hold on. So like, wait, so the, so they will choose to gamble yes. versus a sure inflow of energy that'll just, that'll keep, that'll just keep them alive. Just not basically. So it, 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 it's, it's too little to, to, to survive oh, right, in right, the long right, run. Right. Yeah. So I mean, so so they so they so like they're risk seeking in the in the to 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 avoid loss basically. Yeah, to to avoid the the ultimate bad outcome of basically perishing. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. you could say it, it makes sense, right? But that, that um, um, even if uh, animals don't, if if the outcome is not uh, death, then actually some uh, some decision makers uh, derive additional pleasure from just the risk variance. So the variance in outcomes is more attractive than the same uh, value when it is a steady stream, basically. It's, it's okay. 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 So, let, so, so, so let's get into, into, into it. Like wh why do some people just like the risk regardless of like, they just, they, even if the reward is like, it's perfectly satisfactory for a uh, sure reward, they just, they just rather risk like have that gamble, right? Yeah. Like what, what's that about? Yeah. So, um, economists call this a risk seeking behavior and, um, it's actually, it actually follows uh, quite nicely from, uh, sort of a curve that, that explains your subjective, uh, value function. So we see this mostly, uh, when we're talking about gains that are, um, not in the life or death uh, uh, range, basically. So small gains. When when we're talking about small gains, uh, monkeys and and uh, a lot of humans as well tend to be risk seeking. So what does it mean? It means that if we talk about these uh, utils, so the the measurement of what it's what a particular reward means to you, uh, it actually sh um, when you let people make a lot of choices, you can uh, draw. Uh, the their utility curve uh, by sort of and, and that tells you how much value they place on a particular outcome and uh, the most important aspect is that this curve is not linear so there uh, it's curved in a way that uh, larger outcomes are, are significantly more valued than smaller outcomes so if you have a certain outcome and you have a gamble which uh, you know uh, lies where the outcomes lie on both uh, possible ends of this certain outcome then the, the, the one that is the higher outcome is basically is overweighted versus the one that is on the lower end. And therefore the gamble as a whole is more attractive to these people. Huh. So like when you like, okay, so I, I think I, to, I told you about this when I, when I was looking for my, looking for a new place to stay, right? Like for me, the risk of not having a place to stay was really like way more like it, I, I was more afraid of not having a place to stay than like paying too much for a place to stay. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Yes. So it was like, screw it. Like I'll get, I'll, like you, I, I'll, I'm going to get the first place that says that that's available without being too picky about like, oh, well, you know, trying to make it less expensive or like, can I afford it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, uh, so that means you're risk averse in that sense, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. But like, but, 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 so does, so uh, like, is risk aversion uniform? Like, like, I feel like in certain aspects, you're willing to gamble 
certain aspects you're not willing to gamble like like is that or is it like if someone's risk averse in one domain they're risk averse in pretty much every other domain um well so we know that people tend to become to switch from being risk seeking to being risk averse when the stakes get higher basically Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this illustrates uh, also your your example. Uh, having a place to live is quite high high stakes, so uh, people tend to become uh, risk averse. Right. Also, when we're talking about losses versus gains, so uh, when we're talking about potential yeah potential losses, basically people tend to be more risk averse than their uh, sorry more risk seeking than uh, than for for gains. Um, because there's something really unpleasant about a certain loss. And if there's a small chance that you might be able to avoid uh, the loss, people are more willing to take it rather than uh, when this is, when we talk about this in, in terms of gains. So are um, they willing to, like, are people willing? So let me see if I get this. So people are more willing to gamble if there is uh, an, an, a, a if there is an opportunity to minimize their loss, is that yes. kind of is basically what it is? This is called um, uh, sort of the, the framing effect. So whether mm -hmm. you um, describe a particular gamble as a um, as a positive change or as a negative change, depending from the reference point, basically. Um, when we're talking about um, a particular bad outcome that can be avoided by taking a gamble. Um, People are more more likely to take the gamble than if you describe exactly the same situation, but then from a gain perspective, then people are tend to take the the sure gain. So you mentioned like the frame of reference. So let's like let's just talk about like what you should do if you wanted to motivate someone to take a certain kind of action, right? Like there are certain things that people, there are certain things that say policy like at a policy level or like you know organizations do that seem. They think they should. They, they they think it should work, but it doesn't, right? Like, um, they sort of try to appeal, like like if they want to, you know, minimize the suffering of farm animals, for example, it's something recently, something that I saw recently. Uh, they try to appeal to like make you feel bad instead of like trying to think of it from like a decision making, like a economics perspective, right? Like, to change my behavior in a way that helps these animals, but also, but like. For some reason, it just wouldn't work. Like for me, okay, this is gonna sound gonna sound horrific, but like, like, <laughs> but like, it doesn't like it doesn't impel me to care, you know, like, like I'm not maybe I'm just maybe I'm, maybe maybe I'm just a cold asshole, but like, it would make sense if you had like a more of a, like a, like a like, I don't know, like trying to appeal to things like to to like to your empathy versus trying to appeal, trying to actually make a decision theory sort of uh, mm -hmm. nudge. I think, yeah, I think we spoke about this in class as well. Like, how do you nudge people to do certain things versus not do other things, right? Well, there's different strategies. So you can appeal to emotions and that, that works really well if the target uh, of, you know, uh, so the, the, the target of your nudge uh, is quite similar to the situation that you're describing. So if they can really see themselves in that in that situation, right. uh, empathy will be uh, much easier to achieve. And maybe um, uh, so that that works by sort of taking over the 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 emotion that is being displayed by whatever you put in front of them. And if they really recognize themselves in it, and 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 the situation is horrible, then they will feel horrible and maybe they will do something about it uh, but nudging can also work in a different way so you can appeal to um like the what uh, the herd basically so you could say like uh, uh, like the majority of uh, people like you are uh, filling in their taxes on time and, and that kind of stuff works uh, for motivating people to do that as well they don't want to feel the odd one out uh, but it's a bit, it's a bit, um, uh, it becomes a bit uh, tricky because these policies are usually uh, targeted at a large group of people at the same time, and there, who knows what the exact motivation is for them to uh, to oh, make a sure. change or not. But but yeah. there still are quite some you know significant effects, and the the, the most uh, the largest effect size is always uh, 
the example of uh, opt-in versus opt-out organ donation systems. It's really, really hard to make people change their mind about organ donations, but sure as hell they don't change countries because in one in one country there is an opt-in system and the other country has an opt-out system. I mean, this is not. I mean, that that like that just holds everywhere. Like, for example, uh, from a, like just from a some, from a software development perspective, like the default setting, like what you said as what you said as as default, almost never changes. Because <laughs> people just don't change the defaults; like they just leave it as it is. Yeah, and that's a, that's great a very way, like, strong nudge. Yes, yeah, for sure. But uh, personally, I'm not about this nudge life. Like, like, like the strong. Like, I have, a, I have, a, like, as I feel that's that feels like a. Like, I don't like that. But of course, I have no idea like well, how I'm being nudged, right? Like, I like for all I know, which is why I mean I don't use like. Like I try to avoid the opportunities to nudge me as much as possible. Like I don't know. Like I don't watch TV at all. Like and I don't use social media or anything like that. So I'm basically a hermit. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, but there's definitely that. Okay. Speaking of social media and stuff, I wanted to ask you about something in my personal experience, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's this there's this game, right? That I've been playing since I was like maybe twelve or thirteen years old. Okay. And it's called Dora, okay. And defense of defense of the ancients, right? It started off as, as this. Some guy cobbled together uh, a player made map for this Warcraft thing, right? Right. Now I've been playing this game since now for almost. I've been playing this game in some shape or form for at about about twelve about fifteen years now. I mean, now there's like a newer version. There's like better graphics. There's like mm -hmm. a there's a better pro competitive scene going on. So it's like. You know how people how people watch soccer and like football, basketball. I watch Dota, like pro games and stuff. Okay. Yes. Now, the problem with this game is like I cannot play this game because what I find is like when I start playing this game, mm -hmm. I don't want to do anything else. Like, right. I start playing this game, so mm -hmm. I start. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna play. I'm like, I'm I'm gonna play two matches. I'm gonna like play two or three matches today. Not a big deal. I'm good. Right. And then when I play the game, it's I play, and then after that, things that I used to find enjoyable are not as enjoyable anymore. Like movies are not as fun as this game. Like going out is not as fun as this game. Like hanging out with my friends is not is not as fun as this game. Yeah. Okay. So what? What the hell? <laughs> that, like that's my question. So yes. And 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 then I, maybe I can explain some of the some of the mechanisms that they have. They have implemented in this game that make it so bloody addictive. Yeah. Do you feel manipulated when you play it? Um, when I play it, like okay, my this is my experience when I'm playing it. So 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 the, the it's, it's like every game is like a, is like a chess is like a chess match. So every match is brand new, right? Every everything is every time every game is new, and every and it's way more interactive than a movie, let's say, obviously, because like, you're engaged. So the level of engagement is just like a like a step. Step increase in engagement, and when I'm playing the game, I'm not thinking about anything else. Mm -hmm. Like I'm completely absorbed because, like, there are um, you have to collect gold, you have to kill people. Kill, so it's 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 five versus five. So it's five play five human players versus five human players. Yes. You kill you kill you you kill each other's character. You collect gold. You collect experience. You buy items. You progress. You level up. You destroy buildings to finally eventually kill the enemy team's main base right mm -hmm. so so many little micro rewards like like every time you kill a creep and you get gold like a little, this is like a gold like a like a coin hitting the shit like you know like coins sound right right, right and right. like it's super engaging and it's super stimulating right like for example if i play a game of dota i'm not go i'm not falling asleep for the next hour or two. like no. this is not gonna happen Right. All right, so so we need to talk about dopamine, right? Yes, for sure. Like this is definitely <laughs> something. So like my main fear is like like it's not it's like if the game was just engaging and I loved it, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. But what bothers me is that it makes everything else seem not less as fun. interesting. Less yes. interesting. Yeah. So what's happening? So what's what's, what's so, the yeah. deal? So high, like the sort of the the high overview on this is that probably. 
the game is optimized. Uh, um, it's it's you know it's it's visual presentation in such a way that it it release that it triggers dopamine release in your in your brain by playing it uh, because it gives you intermittent rewards and those For rewards sure. are stimulating yeah. and it's it's hard to let that go um, and uh, there is this. Um, there's this research that is uh, been done on people who have uh, some sort of um, gambling addi- addiction or a behavioral addiction, uh, which can be something like uh, playing a lot of computer games, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they found is that um, the brains of people who self-report that they you know, that, that this is, is impacting their life and they have problems with it, they also re- um, respond not just to uh, the wins and um, the um, uh, the rewards, but also what is what is called a near miss. So imagine you have like uh, two cherries, and the third one is just is just one tick up above, right? Uh, so so gamblers will call this a near miss, and it, they take it as a sign that they're very close to winning because they're oh already God. so close. Yeah, that sounds that's that's like that's. That's yeah, I know that feeling very well. <laughs> yeah. So it is, and we have to acknowledge it's objectively not true, right? It is a, just another uh, stochastic instance, and it doesn't doesn't tell you anything about how close you are to winning or or whatever. Yeah, right? for sure. So, the, yeah. so 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 like now this game, right? When I play this game, every every match I start with the hope that this is gonna be a fun, like a good match. Yeah, because right? because you get paired with random people all over the internet, right? Like your team is with random people. So like sometimes mm-hmm. it's just a bunch of like it sucks. You get stomped, right? Yeah, yeah. But there's always that 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 image in my game, that perfect fun game, you know, that that that, that <laughs> super close, exciting game. Which, to be fair, I've had those games, right? Of course, they don't happen you know they exist, often. right? Yeah. But oh, you see like... them on on YouTube, maybe. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And like, and the worst thing is, you watch professional games. Mm-hmm. And they look amazing, right? Yeah. Like professional, like they're pro players, right? Of course. And then you're like, man, I'm gonna go play because like, I'm gonna have the same experience, but it's not the same experience at all. <laughs> but there's this dragon you keep chasing. It's unbelievable. Right. Yes. So people who have this gambling disorder, they respond to near misses uh, in the same way as uh, to actual hits. So it, it triggers to them some release of um, of dopamine, which in the in turn incentivizes them to. Um, to continue playing, but I think we should take a step back, right, and start uh, bottom up yeah, from dopamine. Yeah. Sure. yeah so sure. you know, what yeah. is it? What's what's going on? Uh, so dopamine is a neurotransmitter. Um, it it belongs to the class of monoamines and uh, more specifically catecholamines, and it is uh, synthesized from uh, uh, an amino acid, uh, tyrosine, and then um, gets made into dopamine, basically. So dopamine is pretty old. It exists in different, um, I mean, evolutionary old. So there's there's different versions of dopamine in a way that you can see in invertebrates, for example, or in insects. Uh, it's slightly different, but uh, the main uh, buildup is the same. And what does it do, or wh- where is it made, basically? So in the brain, there is a couple of places where it's synthesized. Uh, it's in the substantia nigra, and the ventral mental area, and those are uh, little, you know, clumps of neurons that live in the brain stem. And uh, from there, they send out these axons, these projections to the basal ganglia, uh, most notably also the nucleus accumbens, uh, which is a, you know, thought of as a, uh, a very an important area for motivation and pleasure, basically uh, making uh, uh, supporting goal-directed behavior. But there is also axons that go all over the cortex. So uh, from the front of your head to the back, uh, inside, outside, left, right, it goes everywhere, basically. And dopamine has a lot of functions. It supports movement, because if you have a deficit in dopamine, like in Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, people become um, frozen in a way. Mm -hmm. They don't move as smooth uh, as they normally did. It has a, a role to play in learning, it supports working memory, so keeping keeping you focused and, and not distracted, basically. And it has a, a, a very important uh, role to play in actually uh, uh, making predictions about the world and especially signaling when those predictions are violated. And um, 
This is a concept called a prediction error. And it basically happens when um, you imagine a particular outcome. The outcome happens. If it's, if it's better than you expected, then this is a positive prediction error. And if it's worse than you expected, it's a negative prediction error. And it, it has been found that especially the dopamine producing cells in the ventral tegmental area, they show like an impulse, a little spike of a dopamine when there is a positive prediction error and a little dip in their baseline firing rate when there is a negative prediction error. And people have been wondering about you know, what that means. Is it is it like um, yeah, it has probably has to do with learning, with trying yeah, to mean, optimize? Yeah. Yeah. So like you don't want to learn like, but but you like so I mean what's so what's what's the hypothesis? It's like if if some you if you predicted an outcome and you got a, got a worse result, do you want to like unlearn the prediction that you made before and maybe learn something new? Like what's the hypothesis about the uh, prediction error? Yeah. Dip? Yeah. So the idea is that it um, it it sort of instantiates like uh, like a genetic competition between behaviors uh, at the level of their associated outcome. So you 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 basically you chose a particular course of action uh, based on a particular prediction. Turns out the actual result is less than expected. So mm -hmm. next time you might want to not choose this behavior and favor another another course of action. Yeah, but like. No, that's crazy, right? And like, so it's interesting because, you know, even if you, so you, 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 you I mean, I mean, the world is stochastic, right? Yes. So even, even if you have, a, even if you ha make a prediction and you could be completely right or justified in the decision you made based on, based on your experience and what you, what you thought might happen, but just mm -hmm. by chance, it just wouldn't work out. Yeah. Right. So like, that's a problem for one individual. But then if you look at across all the individuals, like some individuals will, will have predicted correctly and gotten and uh, and their and their and that the and that pathway is strengthened, let's say. And some mm -hmm. individuals would have got it wrong and that pathway would have been like nope. Yeah. Fa like failed. So remember I, I talked about the um the fact that we're recording much more cells these days than than before in mm -hmm. neuroscience. And these these um, old conceptualizations of prediction errors they stem from the the time when uh, we were recording like fifteen individual neurons from a particular monkey and they were showing this particular behavior. So these days, when we have a much higher sampling of the of the, what the neurons are actually doing, it turns out that they they instantiate something like um, like a Bayesian uh, posterior distribution, right? Mm -hmm. Of uh, sort of um, there is um a whole bunch of dopamine producing cells and they uh they respond uh, probabilistically to particular cues and rewards and just sort of by summing them together and looking at the average output it, it maps perfectly to the expectation but the individual cells don't don't follow that uh, that scheme one to one so there's always chance for variance and basically um uh, having uh, um, that 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 makes that makes learning flexible. It isn't as as uh, as black and white. Right. It also depends, of course, on how how stable you estimate your environment to be, and that has to do with, I guess you call it meta learning of you know what is the what is the st the state space that I'm in currently. Do right. I have evidence from the past that there is a pretty a surefire relationship between this cue and this outcome? Or have I learned that the relationship is more stochastic? So in the first case, if you encounter a few uh, negatives when you were expecting like a 95% you know, positive rate, it might be a signal that you're actually in a different environment now. So something mm -hmm. has, has changed because your, your, uh, your outcomes no longer match up to the predicted predicted uh, pattern of uh, of hits and misses basically right 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 so the distribution yeah, don't match and you need to shift your distribution it, it, whereas yeah, like like how sensitive are we to the out the overall distribution of events in in our in our day to day life is are we fairly sensitive fairly sensitive like to know what to expect and what not to expect to happen well, we can we can actually of course reason about probability and and actually communicate also about probability with others so this 
it's a very difficult discussion you need to have when you have to talk about like how much uh, health insurance to get when you when you uh, become uh, self-employed, for example. People will ask you, okay, how much you know uncertainty are you willing to live with, basically? And uh, so yeah, you have to actually think about that. Uh, people are pretty good in tracking probabilities, but they have a tendency to um, uh, overweigh very small probabilities and underweigh uh, very large probabilities. So that, again, that's also not linear. There is a bit of uh, distortions happening there at the ends. Right. Okay. Sorry, tan tangent. Let's get back to the, let's get back to talking about dopamine. So okay, the, okay. The main thing I want to ask you is like, so first thing I've I've learned is that I've learned that I should never go to a casino. Like, That's I've, probably smart. Like, so what about the genetic like the genetic component? Like how do, like in terms of uh, addiction and dopamine and such? Is there a yes. strong genetic situation happening here? Yeah. So there is. Um, there is a strong link between decision making and uh, dopamine, and by extension, you can say that people who have issues with dopamine might um, make poorer decisions. One of them being uh, possibly uh, gambling, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very interesting because um, you know how can we be sure that it is related to dopamine? Well. One of the interesting aspects there is that you can look at Parkinson patients who have a, a deficit in dopamine. Uh, the medicine that they get is uh, giving them L-dopa, the, the precursor of dopamine that you can take as a pill, and it gets metabolized into dopamine in, in, the, in the body, basically. This is um, uh, a sort of, um, what is it, like horse medicine. It's quite uh, heavy in a way to sort of promote the, the movement and the behavior that, that is being lost because the cells are dying in uh, the dopamine producing cells are dying in, do in Parkinson. So it actually helps them to keep mobile. Uh, that's very nice. But as a side effect, people become impulsive and risk seeking. And many uh, you know, case reports have been filed about people just uh, starting made to make very um, drastic decisions, leaving their spouses, gambling their money away. Uh, so there is, a, there is a direct relationship there between the intervention, which is giving them extra dopamine, and a profound change in behavior. No, I, I like this. There's also, um, the, I remember one. I remember going to a doctor one time with with with, with someone that I knew, and the, they were we were discussing the possible use of a dop a dopamine a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, for for some for, for something for some conditions she was having, and one of the one of the side effects the doctor said was like you know this might well, we can try it but it might make you more impulsive and it might make you you know do more like more crazy things and I was like well maybe that's not, <laughs> that's not the best idea but like um, so okay is there a way for me to enjoy this game without everything else in my life becoming not as fun? Because I would like to play this game, but I I just can't right now. It just like it comes becomes to the point where it's like that's all I want to do. Like I spend all day thinking about going home and playing this game. Like when I'm out thinking about it, when I'm like it's just a mess. I mean I'm glad I don't play I'm, it now, but like I understand. Yeah. Whenever so, I have a you know like a like a couple of stress like like I relapse. It's like a drug. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. Like, I, I, like I relapsed like a month or so ago. Like and I spent all day playing, and then I was like, "God, this needs to end." And then I just I stopped, and now I don't play it. But like, I I, I yeah. definitely relapse. Like I mean, as far as drugs, as far as relapsing is concerned, this is pretty mild. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not actual like a drug addiction just destroying my life, but it has the potential, know, right? It has yeah. the potential. It definitely has the potential to do that. And what does it tell you about uh, maybe being sensitive to other stimulants as well? Um, so. When you take a step back, um, the definition of like uh, um, a drug problem, according to DSM, is basically that it interferes with your daily activities right. at the expense of you know at the expense of things that you would normally value. Yeah. So does it does it upend your life and 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 do you have a problem with that basically? Yeah. And um, you could say up to a point, uh, it's okay to to 
spend one or two days behind a computer and, and finish this game. But, uh, but there is, is a... there's no finishing. There's no finishing this game. It exactly. never ends. Exactly, it never, never ends. ends. That's the that's yeah. the problem, of course. Yeah, that's the problem. S- so so there is there's there's you know there's a potential for being addicted to this game and i think many many people maybe not you but maybe others definitely are addicted or have been addicted or are in relapse or are sort of you know in what's what's that world in uh uh remission so they they are currently not uh addicted but (laughs) you're sensitized and that is a very interesting aspect of dopamine so um it turns out that um, dopamine processing is um, uh, altered in people with addiction. But um, people with addiction, when they present at the clinic, there's usually a whole range of things that are uh, off about them. They might have malnutrition because they didn't take good care of themselves. They might have other high stress, for example. And we don't know what started what. So did they start taking drugs because they have issues or did the issues come from taking the drugs? So in this case, we usually go to animal models to uh, make a bit more controlled situation. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a couple of paradigms that are very interesting there. So um, uh, research on uh, animals used to start on on drug-seeking behavior in animals used to start with giving them access for two or three hours to basically all the cocaine that they want um, during the day. And this is called short access. So what what happens is that animals like this, they will work towards getting the, the cocaine. So they, they will you know, put in some effort. Basically, this is like pushing a, a little pedal in their, in their cage. And this will uh, give them a little shot. And they actually work up to a level that they, they get, they get uh, a nice high in a way. We, we don't know if it's nice, but they, they, what, what we can show is that they maintain a particular level of cocaine in their blood, which for them is apparently optimal because they don't work beyond that, right? So they're, they're sort of maintaining a particular level. Now there's also long access and long access is basically a, a, the same idea, but then it's, it's for 24 hours or even longer, it's available. Now it turns out that rats, it usually is about rats, that have this short access type of cocaine, uh, they, their behavior changes, but the, the animals who have the long access cocaine, their behavior is catastrophically changed. So they start escalating their drug intake. It becomes more and more and more over time and uh, at the expense of their own uh, well-being also. So people pointed at this as a very nice model for uh, drug-seeking behavior. That's interesting you say that. Like, so one of my friends has a similar problem for the same game, like this, my high school friends. So these are like friends that I've, been since, I've known since high school. So what he does is that he gives himself a best of three matches, right? So if he right. wins the first two matches, it's over. He's done. He, he's done for the day. He can't play anymore. Yeah. But if he loses one and wins one, he gets to play another one to win to finish off the series. And that's yeah. apparently the only way he's been able to like keep this under control. <laughs> but do you think he also intentionally forfeits the second match to play the third one? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, the thing is, the thing is, there's no incentive to do that because you lose. Uh, there's a ranking. There's a. There's a. Okay. There's, there's a. There's a. You you lose. A, your matchmaking ranking points if you lose matches. So there's no interest to lose. Yeah. yeah. So people have been pointing to this long access model as a way uh, that it could mimic um, what's happening in uh, the brain of people who are addicted. And they found that uh, this mostly points to a uh, like a tolerance model. So there are the, the brains of those rats uh, seem like they're tolerant because they don't respond as much more to um, uh, additional dopamine being released, either from drugs or from natural stimuli, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems like the, the brain adapts. But when you think about it, like 24 hour continuous access to, to cocaine is not that the way that humans consume it, uh, mostly. Mm-hmm. So um, we tend to have uh, like an intermittent uh, pattern of taking rewards. And especially if you're playing a game and you don't know when the reward is going to come, this is even more unpredictable and intermittent, and it actually uh, uh, turns out to be a very uh, addictive pattern also, as well for the player and also for rats, basically. So what happens is that these rats who get uh, the intermittent access, 
they consume far less cocaine overall, but they show a much stronger phenotype. So they're much more addicted in their way, in their behavior after this, uh, after this period. And they oh. don't show, they don't show critically, they don't show the, the tolerance. What they show is a sensitization. So let's stay, let's take the, we take the cocaine away, put the red in a cage, then give them a little bit of dopamine and their their response is in their brain is through the roof so it is it is sensitized it's now stronger than it used to be and wait, wait what okay it's, okay say it again like yeah so, so the, the that's on the who are on the short uh, who are on the short axis right on the inter on the intermittent axis okay so they have they have been getting like bouts of um of a lot of cocaine, like five or six minutes, and then 20 minutes, nothing. And then again, five or six minutes, 20 minutes, nothing. So at random, like like in the, like at, at random intervals? Yeah. Yes. So the, the interval changes a little bit, uh, longer or shorter. And uh, it turns out that um, by not having this continuous inflow of, of cocaine, which actually I didn't explain this, but what cocaine does, it, it, it interferes with the dopamine transporter. So the dopamine is released in the, neuro, in the synapse, Normally, it is taken up there by the dopamine transporter and recycled back into the presynaptic membrane. So if you block the dopamine transporter, that means the dopamine is active longer in the synapse. And this produces this sort of over, you know, overactivity of dopamine, basically. So you get, you get 100, 150% bang for your buck for the same dopamine molecule if, if it's not being taken up earlier, basically. Right. That's what's happening. So these rats who've taken the cocaine intermittently their their whole brain is now um as it were sort of poised waiting for the next the next hit to come in and um uh, they they express this much stronger phenotype so it turn uh, it, it it looks more like a model of dopamine hyperactivity rather than do dopamine blunting or hypoactivity which you would get from this really long sustained intake because you have to you have to consider that the brain is fundamentally homeostatic so if there is a for 24 hours just an overload of of cocaine present and dopamine present what the brain is going to do is going to down regulate the number of receptors but because apparently there is now too much input and it's going to up regulate the the reuptake and um in a way sort of there is there's changes that are happening at this longer time scale that just make sure that the now elevated level of dopamine is not so much effective anymore but if you have this intermittent pattern, there's no reason to change your receptors or your protein synthesis because it, it's not sustained, right? But every, every little hit does do something. And it turns out that over time, uh, the, uh, these, these sort of incremental dopamine hits uh, change the entire system in such a way that it is now super sensitized to dopamine. So you could oh. think of this as, uh, you know, needing, needing, um, chasing the same dragon basically, and it has to be bigger and better next time. And maybe hanging out with your friends isn't so interesting anymore because it doesn't provide this particular hit that you need. I mean, man, that's, 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 that's savage. Like it, like, and the thing is, it's just me, weak human being versus <laughs> teams of engineers designers and neuroscientists and psychologists building these things like what yeah. like what hope do i have against this so like i would love to think no i think no i for sure i think so i used to play video games quite a bit like i used yeah. to be like uh this do this i used to play video games uh pretty seriously and what's funny now though it's like now there's an entire ecosystem where you can be you can be a professional player of this game and like yes. make hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a year. But when I was playing it, I was just playing it because I was I was just addicted to it, right? Like, um, and I I stopped playing. I I used to play all kinds of video games, but I stopped playing video like this game. No, this you find this interesting, right? So they did a survey. They did a poll of like a, like a, a, a lot of players. Players who play this game play far fewer other games than players who play other games. 
Yeah, so it's at the exclusion of everything else, basically. Exactly, exactly. It's yeah. like it's like it's like nothing else matters. It's like just this game. And part of it, I think, is part of it's like it's got a really steep learning curve too. So I think that adds to it. So it's like it's funny, but like to actually start having fun with the game, you have I to would play say it. You need, yeah. you need at least two hundred hours of gameplay. Yeah. To actually yeah. start like start knowing how to play the game properly. And well, then it's just like, it's a slow. Yes. So okay. do you see what's happening there? So the, basically the game is is hijacking your natural inclination towards novelty and mm -hmm. uh, a challenge, right? So it's difficult. So the first, the first, um, the first dopamine hits that you get getting are those from your intrinsic motivation. So you want to learn how to play this game and it's frustrating, but that actually is a challenge and you're rewarding yourself for, uh, for mastering it. But then over time, you sort of get into this neural groove, and you start relying on the extrinsic motivation of the uh, of the of the of the of the reward system, the reward ecosystem, more than your intrinsic. Uh, uh, so abilities. it was even crazier. So like when I when I used to play in high school, um, I was in Sri Lanka, right? And we had this small community of people who. So to play the game against other players, someone has to host a server basically, and then nine mm -hmm. other players join the server and play. Right, and to be a host, you need to have a pretty, you need to have a pretty fast internet connection, right? Mm -hmm. Like like you need to have a higher bandwidth connection than most people have at home, right? So like I paid to have that extra bandwidth, right? And and also in so Sri Lanka, there's a small community. There was like 300 people who played the game, right? So and everyone knew everybody. So reputation was like real. You had like real reputation, and because. Mm -hmm. There were only a few people who could host games. Your reputation you, your reputation decided whether you got to play or not. I right? see. So like, el yeah. like only ten players can play at a time, right? So yeah. if only six people have hosted games, only sixty people get to play out of the three hundred who are, on, who are online, right? Yeah. And you had and you have real incentive to get good because you get reputation, and then you were known in this community. Like people knew me. Like when I mm -hmm. go somewhere, people knew who I was. Like it was a it was a crazy trap. <laughs> it's such a nuts trap. So like, well, I, I have I have some um you know a piece of good good news for you. Okay. And it it also comes from uh, uh rodent neuroscience. Nice. So it turns out that um uh, you can uh, you can you can teach these rats to self administer cocaine, right? And they will do this reliably, but only if there's really nothing else to do in their cage. Mm. So, um, only recently, and it, it blows my mind that it had to wait so long. Uh, people actually tested whether rats would prefer social contact with another rat over maybe infusing cocaine all day. Yeah. And it turns out that uh, the vast majority of the rats actually vastly prefer the social interaction yeah, they rather than. To play. I, I really just do like like they'll work more to play than than to than, than to uh, get cocaine. I think. Exactly. Something, something like that. So like, you know, so it's good news, right? <laughs> that's good news. But the thing is like, oh man, that's such, that, that is great news. So I have that. So that's what I've been doing. I've been trying to fill my life up with things that I'd rather do than play Dota. Like this, for example, yeah. like, like yeah. this podcast or like, like all the other extra things I do. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and like working out all the time. Cause I, I, I uh, but funnily enough though, that has always been a constant for me. Like, so I've been, I've been like training and like being, in, I've been in, in the gym mm -hmm. for almost 10 years, 15 years, right? And yes. even at the height of playing video, at playing Dota, I, w I still very regularly went to the gym and I still do. And that like, there's something, I'm not sure what it is about it that's keeping me, that's kept me motivated for so long, like almost like 15, like 10, like 15 years now. Yes. And like, uh, I don't know, that's been fun. Like people, like, do I like hanging out with people more than I like playing? To be honest, I like watching movies and hang out with, more than hanging out with most people. But like, maybe, maybe that just means I need to have, have make, more interesting, make more interesting relationships. But uh, I mean, uh, it, it might be that, that, uh, that you know, you, you have a more a penchant for introversion and for extroversion, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but on this, at the same time, you go to the gym. Also, this this could be a very individual experience because you're just going there for yourself. It, it's mm -hmm. also a social environment, but less less social than maybe the other people than you know other options. 
Yeah, for, for me, the gym feels like like um, like when I go in there, uh, it's like um, I feel it's like the, it's like one of the places in my life where I feel like I am uh, in my element. Like I'm in my mm -hmm. like I am. I know like I'm competent in this in, in the environment. Um, I feel like there's a sense of um, I want to say like. I don't know. Like it, it's just I, I I just like being in there. It, like it feels like it feels like home. But like that's probably because I've been there. I've been in the gym for so long. I feel comfortable around those things, and I feel comfortable with those with those tools. But like, yeah. But you would uh, go to a different gym, right? If so, if you yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't matter. Like like oh, that, that's that's interesting actually. Yeah, no, you're right. It's not the specific of this. Yeah, this yeah. Like like, like during COVID, I just like I still worked out. I still did everything by myself at home. So what I think. It might be a reason or you know and uh something that is at play here is that uh by working out uh, your body releases endorphins which mm -hmm. is uh you know class of op of opioids basically <laughs> of course <laughs> i'm just a, <laughs> addicted to something you're just else. a just a, bu a bunny a monkey for drugs man <laughs> but those those are the ones that actually make you feel good right so yeah but, yeah 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 Dopamine yeah. by itself is not making you feel good. It's just it's it is triggering an incentive, an incentive to do something. It is a it is a motivation to action, but dopamine by itself doesn't make you feel good. Right? Yeah. It's it's not the feel good hormone. The, the people you no. think think feel it, it, not think, think it's, it's not it's not at all. Right? It's like it's the make you go and do stuff uh, chemical. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. No, for sure. So. What happens if you have too much dopamine? So that's also um, people who take drugs, obviously. But um, we can talk also about, like, for example, schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it turns out that people who are in a psychosis uh, or um, uh, have 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 had psychoses or um, uh, are actually diagnosed with schizophrenia, uh, it's thought that they um, uh, they suffer from like uh, um, an overactivity of the dopamine system, and it produces uh, a psychosis. Basically, it can produce psychosis. Uh, this also ha can happen when when people uh, take recreational drugs, um, and uh, we know that probably dopamine is involved because it turns out that like the majority of the drugs that help with the psychosis are dopamine receptor antagonists. Mm -hmm. So they they block the receptor for dopamine, and dopamine can't have its effect basically that it would normally have. Interesting. So why would it be useful to you know have a class, a group of people, minority of people, who have this very active uh, dopamine system, or maybe a hyperactive dopamine system? You can think of this maybe as the like the tail end of the distribution of people that have a um, neural wiring. That predisposes them to, you know, go up, get get up, and go out and do things, right? So they are these. Maybe the people are towards the exploration uh, uh, end of the axis, whereas the majority of the people are maybe more more in an exploitation mode. So, you know, population is a population benefits from uh, a minority of people who are uh, uh, adventurous and try new things and make. The, the population more resilient as a whole. I listened to this book recently called "The Molecule of More." Uh, it's all about dopamine, and the, and and, the, and they made 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 a similar point where it's like the, I think the, it's like immigrant populations, like uh, people who have moved to a moved to a new country, they have a high incidence rate of uh, of of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. Like so, like that kind of kind of tracks, right? Like if you're if you're willing to like move and go and do some other go, go to a completely different place and risk and you know like take the risk and move and do all these things, that you have a high incidence of like 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 your know, dopamine has something to do with it. And I think the U.S. has a much that has a higher because U.S. is actually a country of immigrants, right? Like a, like mostly immigrant well, mostly immigrated from all over mm -hmm. the world. Yeah. And apparently they have a higher, much higher incidence of uh, this disorder than anywhere else. I maybe like I'm I'm pretty confident confident about what I just said, but if if anyone listening, just double check on that. 
<laughs> you can put but, it in the uh, put it in yeah. the episode notes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. just uh, but like uh, well there's two things right so it could be yeah. it could be a sampling bias so you could be mm-hmm. sampling from people who are more risk seeking and therefore also more prone to get schizophrenia that's possible yeah yeah, yeah. It might also be that you're sampling from a uh, population that uh, uh, is exposed to much more uh, societal adversity because they're trying to get into a society and they maybe are confronted with racism or poor uh, socioeconomic standards when they're immig- uh, immigrating. Mm-hmm. And um, there is a um, schizophrenia is increasingly being thought of as a neurodevelopmental um uh, there's a different neurodevelopmental predisposition to maybe getting schizophrenia. And then there's usually like an ex- an exacerbating circumstance. Like maybe there's a, a second hit somehow that puts you over the edge. And this could be stress or, um, uh, you know, something like that that what triggers a al- psychotic episode. What about alcohol? Alcohol and dopamine? What's the, like, is there, is there anything there or is like not even... Because I tell you something, um, like I, I stopped playing video games and drinking at about the same time and my life has gotten way better. <laughs> <laughs> but of course that means nothing, but like... Good on just, you. Just, uh, just saying. Yeah, so, so alcohol works on the, the, the GABA system, so the inhibitory uh, uh, type of neurons in the brain and generally. Mm-hmm. But it, there is some relation there with dopamine, but I, I, don't, I don't have enough uh, information on that to, uh, to speculate. So the the question is this is like the question is not why do people take cocaine and drugs and meth and alcohol it's why do people not do that all the time because like it would be so rewar- it would be so rewarding right like how how do you build a life so that you have things that are more interesting and more fun than some of these things but like that's not the, the, for, to me it feels like that's getting that's getting harder and harder like the more stimulating and the more engaging these things become, I feel like it's getting harder and harder to like fill your life up with other like because because the reason games like Dota are engaging is like you said is it's it hijacks mechanisms that were built for you to function in the world right like yes Dota's like Dota has a mechanism where you you know you you grind you basically you have to run around kill little little things do yeah. these menial things collect gold and then buy bigger bigger things to to accomplish bigger tasks, which is yeah. basically life, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. But if you just play the game, you get the. It seems like it satisfies that 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 instinct or that drive to a, such a degree that it feels that that it makes it feel like the other things are, are not even that important anymore. Yeah, which is pretty ridiculous. So well, economists uh, have already pointed to this idea of di- diminishing returns. So the concept of marginal utility tells you that the more you acquire from a particular um, source of utility, be it money or, uh, I don't know, uh, fancy sports cars, Mm -hmm. uh, the increase from zero to one is the largest. And then every next increase is uh, slightly less valuable. So if you would, if you consider this true, and it's a bit of a simplification, but then the best way to get uh, as much satisfaction in your life is to make the first step on all the possible axes because that's going to give you the most exposure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's that's actually very interesting. Like, huh? But like, but there's something to the the there is something there's something rewarding about getting good at one thing, right? Like, there's this yes. there's a definitely like a there's a feedback and feel good mechanism somewhere built in there. Like, getting like improving your competence. Like for example, starting new things is always is definitely fun, mm-hmm. but um, like keeping like keeping keeping yourself accountable to do to keep doing those things or like trying to do those things and improving and seeing yeah. improvement is also a huge, but is also a That's huge a, like. Uh, but there is there is there is a big problem there because um, of this again of this homeostatic adaptation because. Uh, now you've you've changed your reference point. So the next time uh, mm-hmm. you need to be better than you were before. Otherwise, you feel bad because yeah. even object you're still object <laughs> objectively really good. If you drop out of the top ten, uh, then you're going to be having a, a very awful day, you know, which would be a great day for the ninety nine percent of the of the other people who are not as good in this game as as 
the top players are obviously yeah. I mean, at one point, I was like one of the best in the country. That was pretty. It was yeah. pretty badass. Like, and like I was pretty well known. And like, my, and and my parents, God, like bless their souls. Like my mom, my mom literally ripped the cord out of the wall. And was like, no, enough. enough. Yeah, We're done with this, right? And thank God, God bless her. <laughs> but um, I would have to agree with your mom. Yes. Yeah, Otherwise, I, w- sure. I might get in trouble as well. I, I imagine. Yeah. It, <laughs> Does she listen to the podcast? Is she still yeah, around? Yeah, no, no. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. she, okay. she's, uh, yeah, she, for sure, made a good call on that one. But like, the thing is, I think at least, at least, I am getting more aware of where my pit, my, my pits are, right? Like, so I can avoid them. Like, I know, I am certain, I'm like this in certain things. Like, I know I should, like, I know for a fact that I am not the person who should start gambling. Like, that's just the, that's just not gonna be, that's not gonna end well for me. It's very, well, it's it's valuable knowledge, right? And yeah, um, sure. even if you're aware of all these cognitive distortions and biases that we have, it doesn't mean that you can avoid them completely. That's actually mm-hmm. quite a frust- frustration among, uh, uh, you know, behavioral yeah, uh, sure. economists, basically. Yeah. But you can turn it around because you now you know you have the recipe of how to um, give yourself a very high dimensional intermittent reward. And you know that this is going to be the best the best thing you can do for your own brain mm-hmm. is to structure your life in such a way that you're going to have like a lot of sources of random rewards. So this could be a friend that is, you know, calling you to see a movie or it could be some other interest or, uh, you know, a particularly nice podcast that you're listening. So, you know, by diversifying your portfolio, you're doing yourself and your brain and your, you know, your sort of your... Uh, a thirst for stimulation, uh, really a good service. That's true. So like, so, so inserting some form of intermittent reward into my life, definitely. Like, so. Across dimensions, weird. right? Yeah, as, yeah, as broad it, as possible. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> weird. Like, like uh, I, I'm, I'm trying, trying, trying to think of the things that motivate me and like, like, uh, like, you know, like when I first started working out, the motivation was like a bunch of different things, but then, you know, you had a program that you had to follow and like, you know, like getting stuff done, seeing the, seeing your strength increase or your like your physique get better, blah, blah, blah. But it evolved over time. For me now, it's like, I just go to the gym and I do what I feel like doing. And I, as long as I feel like I busted my ass and like, I'm exhausted, I'm happy. And like, again, it's probably because like, but then again, now, now I'm realizing that, now, that you just don't, now that you mentioned it, over the years, my workouts have gotten way more intense, <laughs> right? Like now I'm like doing way more stuff in way less time to, to work. like literally. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this random, this random guy, this is just, just a, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to brag, but this random guy <laughs> at the gym, he was like staring at me and, uh, and he was like, and, he, and then I was like, man, why is this guy staring at me? And then he walked up to me and he was like, man, he, he just, this, this random person was like, man, if I tried to do half of that it would break me in half and i was like and then now oh, this, yeah. now i'm realizing yeah. it's like damn like yeah it's I've, I've had to it's like a i've had to just increase the intensity of things that i do just to keep that keep that motivation going right yeah but that's crazy <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's like uh, okay so all right. Then, I mean, you could, you could, I could talk to you forever, but I'm not going to take up much more of your time. Plus, it's getting close to bedtime for me, so I need yes. to put this put this away. This has been super interesting. Um, uh, I'd enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's very nice to talk about um, about all these aspects and how we're basically sort of chasing like a multitude of dragons uh, in yep. different sh- forms and shapes. Yeah, for sure. But um, yeah, you know, observing uh, your own processes and your biases, and also keeping good habits like yeah. uh, a, a good bedtime. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure, dude. I have. It's to, very nice. I have to. I had to keep this like I had to keep the stuff in lock because otherwise I'm like, like, my, my life. Yeah, it's basically just uh, just me like avoiding these random holes to fall into. Like uh, trying to stay productive because I know how easy it is to get just like. I don't know, cause I, cause I, I've been, uh, I've been, in, I, like I've been to a situation where like all I did was play video games. I was not doing anything productive. I was, I was not, I was like, I was, I was, I was, you know, I used to be, I was, re- I used to be really fat. 
I used to play a lot of video games. I didn't have anything really going for me. And I used to drink and drink way too much. Like, it was terrible, right? But it was still, but so, I, so I had to cut some of these things back and find like more intrinsic reward. Like, just the main thing was, I, I started doing was like, I, I, I thought, okay, well, if I find video games so rewarding, why don't I structure my life like a video game, right? And like, and like, and like, see if I can build like you know intrinsically rewarding things that I can do to keep my life entertaining, right? And like, and it, and it turns out it's it's kind of nice, like it kind of worked out. But hopefully, it will uh, uh, it will keep working out. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll leave you with um, a little bit of uh, of, of Greek wisdom. Yeah, um, please. That, that I remember from my my school days. Uh, this is from the, uh, the 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 Temple of Apollo in in Delphi, and it has uh, three uh, three axioms written there that you might know. The first one is uh, seautun, which means uh, know yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. So you have to know yourself uh, um, to uh, navigate through life successfully. Nothing to excess. Also. <laughs> <laughs> but the third, the third one is maybe the most important one, and that one is certainty brings insanity. Yeah, that's 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 like from a from a dopamine perspective, that is so like wow, you know, that's crazy. That's like so true, right? Oh, that's that's fantastic. Okay, anyway, uh, let's that leave was it there. great. That was, yeah. let's, let's leave it at that. Thank you so much for your time. You're very um, welcome. I will probably I'll see you enjoy your holidays and I'll uh, I'll, I'll see you around on campus I guess. Wonderful. Thanks. Right. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. That was legit one of the best conversations I've, I've ever had. I hope you learned something and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.